Okay, so Jim Wilson, Editor-in-Chief of Human Gene Therapy, thanks for joining us today. Now, Glad to be. Thank you. Now, you've been involved in developing the field of gene therapy for a long time. What provoked you to investigate business-related issues that led to your commentary in the January issue of Human Gene Therapy on disruptive technology? Well, John, as you know, I've been doing this for a long time, in fact, 31 years to be uh, precise, and it has taken us a while to get to the point where uh, we really uh, have progressed to clinical trials that have shown some success. This uh, important advance that we've seen in several different diseases has been the result of uh, many years of basic research and most importantly the development of second generation vector or gene transfer technologies and the last two to three years uh, the field has regained a significant support from the public from foundations in the government because there have been a number of clinical successes in early phase one studies. The next step is commercialization. That's how we bring the technology uh, to the people. That's how it's manufactured. That's how it's distributed. I've been involved in facilitating this next step, in part due to the fact that it's our technologies that have been involved in some of these uh, successes that have created a platform of uh, a vector that could possibly be broadly uh, uh, relevant and broadly distributed. So in working with the licensees of our technology, several uh, pharma uh, biopharmaceutical companies and biotech companies, I've been surprised at how little traction that we have achieved in investing these programs within these organizations and in securing finances to support the next phase, which is the clinical development. And it's actually been quite disappointing, and it led me to uh, have some discussions with my colleagues at the Wharton School here at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where I am a professor, uh, to learn about other emerging technologies that have preceded us in areas other than uh, biomedical research. Uh, and uh, where that landed me is this notion of disruptive technologies that was made popular in the mid-late 90s by a professor at the Harvard Business School by the name of Clayton Christensen. Reading some of his work, it became clear to me that gene therapy is a disruptive technology. Describe what you mean by disruptive technology and what barriers it creates for the commercial development of gene therapy. Well, Professor Christensen uh, delineated in a 1995 uh, review uh, uh, from Harvard that there are innovations that disrupt existing markets or, va or uh, value networks and thereby replace the existing technology. Some examples outside of, of uh, biomedical research would be the steamship replacing sailing ships in terms of transport of people and, and, uh, and goods. Uh, something probably more relevant to us and uh, in the younger generation is this downloadable digital media as opposed to DVDs or CVDs. Uh, and, um, in learning about this, uh, I'd like to share with you one example that has uh, emerged in the area of gene therapy that uh, we we'll use as a, as a point of reference in discussing uh, this disruptive technology notion, and that's hemophilia. There was a paper that was published, uh, I think the third week of December, uh, 2011, in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, using one of our vectors uh, called AAV, uh, in which these investigators from London and St. Jude's Hospital here in the United States uh, were able to uh, treat patients with hemophilia, which is uh, a disease due to a genetic defect in a clotting factor. And as a result of this, uh, they cannot uh, stop bleeding when injured, and sometimes they have spontaneous bleeds. The existing technology came out of uh, the bottom pharmaceutical industry, which is a protein replacement. So uh, manufacture the protein based on cloning the gene, 
and to keep infusing this protein into individuals that have hemophilia, which requires for their, for their life repeated infusion of protein. What gene therapy did, and what we had hoped it would do, is one time injection of a vector, vector encoding the protein uh, that's defective in these patients, led to a sustained and prolonged level of the protein. In this very small study, only six uh, subjects, four of the six, uh, they no longer needed any other protein replacement, and the others uh, diminished protein replacement. So, so this is disruptive. It's, it's, a, it's a new model. It, it disrupts potentially the existing uh, 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 products for hemophilia. And so in, in talking about what these barriers are, I think that Professor Christensen nicely uh, articulated the notion of, uh, that's been popularized in the press about the innovator's dilemma. And uh, John, I just want to uh, read a quote from some of his work, uh, which really summarizes the innovator's dilemma, and, and I think in a very real way, which we can all understand, points out what some of the challenges are uh, when dealing with an, uh, disruptive technology. And so, in this question uh, he, he, that he poses, that how can executives simultaneously do what is right for the near-term health of their established businesses? while uh, focusing adequate resources on the disruptive technologies that ultimately could lead to their downfall. This is the innovator's dilemma. And so when thinking about that, this is uh, an interesting context to try to understand what some of our challenges would be as we try to bring gene therapy uh, into the biofarm space. First problem is there isn't an existing business model for this uh, innovative technology, which is a recurring theme in, uh, uh, in the literature in this space. So, so, for example, with hemophilia, the protein replacement product, as it currently exists, um, that uh, you're charged for every infusion, you require multiple infusions, the average cost or, uh, ranges up to 300,000 a year for hemophilia replacement protein to try to prevent bleeding. And this is for the life of the individual. Let's say for purposes of our discussion that a one-time injection of a vector would lead to prolonged expression of the protein for let's say 10 years. Does that mean that one, that the company that develops that could charge 10 times 300,000 or $3 million for the injection? Hard to say, probably not. What kind of motivation would companies that are involved in that kind of product have in developing this alternative approach, in which it's really unclear as to what the pricing would be, and in fact, whatever it would be, could be significantly less than what they could recover from the, uh, from the protein replacement uh, itself. Um, and there are, then there are ways in which people could consider new business models for example, is it possible that one could charge the insurance company an annual fee for as long as that gene therapy worked? And, and as I talked about in my commentary, there are significant challenges to that, clearly. The second problem of the innovator's dilemma relates to the difficulties that established businesses, such as the biopharmaceutical industry, have in trying to promote the development and the commercialization of these uh, innovative approaches that were so nicely uh, summarized in that quote that I gave you from, uh, from uh, Christensen. And, and the problems are, when you uh, think about them, quite obvious. These businesses develop uh, a certain culture, uh, certain business practices, uh, metrics for success, and ways in which they make decisions based on data of market, financial projections, these kinds of traditions are not conducive to promoting internal to those companies um, uh, the kind of uh, disruptive technology that we're talking about for gene therapy. And those are just some of the challenges, John. I think your discussion in the journal article and some of the points you made here are definitely going to lead to a lot of further discussion among people. 
uh, both within and without the gene therapy field, because you're bringing up a lot of points I don't think have been considered before. Uh, a few minutes ago, you mentioned some disruptive technologies like the steamship and downloadable uh, material from, from the, the Internet. So based on experiences with other disruptive technologies, what lessons can be learned to facilitate the commercial development of gene therapy? There are a couple, and, and, and I'm actually, despite uh, the concerns, quite optimistic. The first is to begin the development of applications of the disruptive technology, not in a mainstream market, but in niche markets, possibly markets that would not be disruptive or for which there would be less concern, setting the precedent and then building from that. For gene therapy, we're incredibly well posed uh, to proceed along that, uh, along that path. So for example, many of the early models of gene therapy that are being pursued turn out to be orphan diseases, primarily because they represent those that are uh, most easily treated and most easily evaluated for treatment. Furthermore, they are, have significant unmet need so that the urgency and the sense uh, of importance in, in moving along these niche markets in orphan diseases uh, is really further reinforced. So I, I think we've satisfied for very different reasons, uh, one of the first principles that emerged from, from, from some of these studies. Just a corollary to that, though, John, I'd like to point out, our focus on uh, rare diseases, unmet need early in the field also positions us very well with the regulatory agencies, such as FDA, who very much embrace uh, commercial development uh, in these areas that are largely underserved. The second lesson is how best to develop this business, and, and there are some very important lessons learned, one of which had to do with uh, personal uh, laptop computers. And there were many companies that were heavily involved in the information technology business that were largely based on mainframe or so-called microcomputers. And, and, and all, uh, or many, tried to make a play in the PC or personal computer business. But one did it very well, and that was IBM. It's a very interesting story. The way IBM did it was they, set, they created a separate business unit that was independent and not influenced by the business of IBM. And it was geographically separate. I think it was in Florida that they charged with developing PC technology. And they succeeded. They were able to leverage the uh, resources and, uh, and, and some of the talent from the larger company without being hindered by the culture of the mainframe microcomputer business. And they became the industry leader, uh, as, you, uh, as you well know. So how does that apply to gene therapy? Well, I think that one approach may be uh, similar to the IBM approach is in the setting of biotech companies. Uh, where, where one can create the value networks and one can create the culture conducive to developing a disruptive technology, but in collaboration with a, with a biofarm in which the resources could be obtained. So taking it outside of, out of the pharmaceutical or large biotech into smaller biotech um, and benefiting from those resources. Now another obvious uh, area for resourcing this model is venture capital, which traditionally has been really what has sustained or, uh, the uh, biotech industry. And I find that there will be challenges, uh, and I believe that it's going to be hard, uh, especially now uh, these investors are uh, quite discerning, uh, very much focused on short timelines and uh, early uh, and obvious liquidity, and almost by definition a disruptive technology wouldn't fit that formula. Having said all that, I do think that there uh, are uh, examples in which the field has progressed so far uh, that that the timelines are short uh, and the opportunities for liquidity may be there with a successful commercial product. And then just one final point, John, that I want to end on um, for us to think about with respect to the business of gene therapy is despite the fact that there aren't obvious new business models to align with this so-called one-and-done injection of vector and sustained expression. You know, despite that, uh, it's clear already, based on pilot studies, and what we're going to be seeing 
that gene therapy is going to be very useful in dealing with diseases for which there are very little other treatments or no treatments in which are disabling and lethal diseases. My view of that is that our society has already shown that if we can help those individuals in those severe dire circumstances, that our society is willing to reimburse and compensate those who develop those treatments uh, uh, in a way that's commensurate with the value. So I do think that there are some interesting and important business models early on, and I do believe that 2012 we're going to see some important activity uh, in the commercial space. I think it's going to be slow, but I think it's going to grow quite rapidly.